Thank you, Jerry. As you can see, Jerry is full of surprises. So what I'll do is build on Jerry's humor and wit to first put the leadership discussion in the context of the Boston Pledge. Many of you know about the Boston Pledge, some of you don't. It's likely to the members of the Pledge, the people that we serve, that we spend a little bit of time about Boston Bridge and then move into a bit more serious discussions on leadership, building on the humorous discussion of leadership. But in leadership, it's actually about humor. So I think uh, we would keep the process humorous as possible, the dosage of seriousness here and there. So the Boston Pledge uh, was born as uh, uh, Jahangir was talking about in 2001, with the basic, very, very basic philosophy of how to cultivate growth at the grassroots, how to cultivate innovation for the seven percent of the people. And, you know, we have to keep in mind, we are the minority. How the minority could serve the majority, that was a fundamental theme of Boston Pledge. And in the process, as Jerry was talking about, how to uncover the power within, powers in this room and the powers that we want to serve. And more importantly, the powers that whom we want to serve. In fact, one of our colleagues here did not feel, feel very comfortable when he used to say, you empower the people at the base of the pyramid. Ruma, if you remember that one. And we said, we will not empower, we will uncover, because you have the power within. So we are continuously working on that theme, and the, basically to bring the spirit of public service forward. You know, even the people who call themselves public servants, they end up serving themselves, and that's why we have problems in Washington and various capitals. They go into public service to serve public, but when you become a senator or a congressman, you end up serving yourself to stay in power. And that's why one of the, we see the gridlocks in various centers of uh, leadership. So how do we inspire higher levels of innovation to engage with the grassroots and in the process become more resourceful and, and serve the different issues that we uh, want to address? Now, the fundamental focus of leadership has been around, this is for the internal team. You know, there are different types of professionals come and serve the Boston Pledge. So one is one of professional respect. That whether I'm coming from a field of mathematics, or field of water, or field of education, we respect each other, we trust each other, and in the process we do real-time work in the field, and we genuinely care what we do. So when Yeri was talking about leadership is all about meaning, and this is where we attach most of our meaning to, that all these four fundamental building blocks has to be respected to take the spirit of public service forward. Now there are several programs we do. One of the things I, we are very, very proud of what we call the Entrepreneurship Springboard Program, which we've been doing for the last about 10 years, not right from the beginning, but maybe one year after we conceived the Boston Plan. What we do there is to really reach out to the people at the base of the pyramid. We have done it in, it in Dorchester, in Boston, we have done it in Alexandria, we have done it in Calcutta, we have done it in Aurangabad in different parts of the world where we bring together people who could not afford to go to high school, could not go to college, bring them together and then we do a program what we call Harvard Business School in four hours. So Harvard Business School that which teaches over a period of two years or $140,000 I believe could be taught in four to five hours if you have a fresh mind and if you genuinely care. And I've seen some brilliant business plans which come out of these fresh minds who are people at the base of the pyramid. So this is something that you guys can get involved. It's very, very rewarding. And basically it talks about how we invert the pyramid. Because instead of looking at the pyramid and say those are the people at the base of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid, we don't, don't even use the word bottom of the pyramid. We use the term base of the pyramid. So that base is something which has to be stable so the top of the pyramid to survive. And today's world, even in this country, the top, what, one person that comes from, what do you see, 50 person, 60 person in the world, that's very unstable, which means the base is fragile. Now this is the United States. So when you go to countries like India or Brazil or South Africa or Nigeria, things are even worse. And you have a challenge. And if you just want to live with that, I think we are basically not serving ourselves, 
if you want to be really selfish about it, you want to be at the top of the pyramid where the base of the pyramid is strong. If the base is fragile, you're going to collapse. And that's what we've seen in the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. We have seen that in uh, France, the French Revolution. So either we have to wait for another big revolution to come, and this time it's going to be global, thanks to the internet, thanks to social media, be dangerous. Or you can instill that revolution in your mind and in the process take it forward. So I think that's how we look at the, this challenge, and we do some business plans that are not getting to it. We try to help people develop skills and confidence. So ultimately, they write a business plan, and we award the business plan every year. And then we try to create these experiments where we try to bring in different kinds of skill base to the people like Mr. X to, or Ms. X to create uh, intellectual ferment, business ferment, which could lead to uh, big possibilities. You know, we often forget that Thomas Edison was a person for the base of the pyramid, as was Andrew Carnegie. But these guys changed the course of history. You know, we are in this room with electricity because of the innovation power of Thomas Edison. But Thomas Edison did not finish high school, did not go to MIT, but MIT did exist that time. Princeton did exist that time. Caltech did exist that time. But electricity came out of a person called Thomas Edison who did not finish high school. So I think those possibilities are there, and we want to give birth to such possibilities. We're serving some villages. This is a village in 1983, as you could see. Uh, that particular person was here last year. We did a program in this room and at MIT as well. But the point is we are involved in this village, which we call Loki Kantapur, which is south of Calcutta. And now we are trying to establish an innovation center there, which is to help people in the villages innovate. And this innovation center that we want to create would help people access, give people access to woodworking, carpentry, physics labs, chemistry lab, so they can do their experiments. The experiments done at MIT often do not work on it down to the people at the base of the pyramid. On the other side, when people have the fresh mind, have some of the, some access to the facilities, obviously one could expect there could be a lot of new possibilities which could emerge. And that's what we are doing in this particular village. And I would not get into the details, but there are a lot of different things at play. We want to collect, connect with uh, satellite. So when we are doing workshops in one village, we can connect with thousand villages. So one discussion we are right now having is with some telecommunication companies. You see that we do a workshop saying location A, it is not only for location A, perhaps it could be broadcast at the same time in thousand different locations. So obviously there are a lot of interesting things one could do, obviously it would depend upon the innovation power of uh, the individuals in this room. So now I'll talk about, given the challenges in front, Build on what Jerry discussed, what is leadership going to be and how you could empower yourself or how you can <coughs> cover the power of leader in you so that indeed you could see yourself differently in the 21st century. And I would literally take not more than 20 minutes because I really want to see the other drought is also addressed with equal amount of intensity to the drought of water. But I'll talk about the drought of leadership. Now this program that I'll discuss with you very similar to what Jerry has discussed, comes out of leadership programs that I have done for various companies around the world, from Japan to the United States, at different levels of management. Some of it is the board level, executive committee level, where the, where the focus has been how to activate their nth sense. You know, we were talking about the fifth discipline, the fifth sense, the fourth sense, how to activate the nth sense, which is how do we able to see the world the possibility which normal eyes would not be able to see? And that's what separate our people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and the rest. They see things which others are not seeing, and then they engage with full commitment, and things happen. Then for the senior management, which is the general management, how to mobilize degrees of freedom of self-expression. You know, all of us have desire to express ourselves, but how do you express yourself so that you could indeed create a tremendous meaning in the process of bringing value to society. So that's what um, the, the second program is all about. And third is for more younger people, the emerging leaders, how do you help uh, people in their 20s and 30s develop a sense of ownership of the problem that they connect with. 
you know, as you could see, many of the great leaders that we talked about, Andrew Carnegie earlier, he started his business at the age of 24, he did not go to school. He came to this country at the age of 10 with his father. He used to work in a factory from the age of 10 to 22. He used to work from 10, 6 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock in the night. But then he gave birth to the biggest steel company in the world. So there are indeed some great possibilities that we want to uncover. Now the leadership program that I do, and it's very much in line with what Gary discussed, it really brings together Western and Eastern philosophy. Now, Western philosophy, if you really look at much of the writings of people like Aristotle, Plato, John Law, essentially talk about rationality of choices. Great leaders are great decision makers that hold and move forward. And Alexander's the word coming to play. But when you look at the Eastern philosophy, and there the more the issue is, how do I as a leader harmonize with the environment and bring, bring people together? And when we talk about leadership, and the programs that we are doing around the world, we talk about how to bring both these elements. You have to be decisive, you have to be strong, you have to be bold, yet you have to be able to harmonize yourself with the people around you, with the environment. So this is what the essential of leadership, and that's what I think, Jerry, much of your leadership program is all about. And you can only harmonize with the environment when you know who you are. And that's where often we fail. And I fully agree with Jerry that some of the challenges are very, very serious. So leadership is about a choice. We want to spend the time to know who you are and in the process connect with the world. Is it all about, it's not about bossing. It is not about becoming a CEO. In fact, I would say leadership is, a, a good leader is one which, who doesn't depend upon titles. Because titles can be given to you by someone, they're always given to you by someone. And it should be taken away by someone. But leadership is all about yourself with or without title, you can influence outcomes. Now, uh, Jahangir was talking earlier about, uh, in one year we have 500 people in this room, and this year we have perhaps 50 or 60 people in this room. That doesn't matter. What matters is that Jenny is absolutely right, Jahangir is right. What matters is people who care about the problems we're talking about, they will be here. They will find a way to come here. And that's, again, a choice that we want to choose about being lazy versus engaging with one or two two problems of our times. So is this about being genuinely responsible? <coughs> and leadership rests on responsible and full acceptance of responsibility. So when we talk about the Boston Pledge of the droughts that we are talking about today, the drought of water and drought of leadership, it is we accept that responsibility. And how serious are we? Is it just about a presentation on Sunday and Saturday afternoon? Or is it something that we want to really take forward with full <coughs> seriousness? So often when I talk about leadership at the CEOs, or for the matter for governments, we talk about leadership or in terms of responsibility and full acceptance of responsibility. Leadership is a lot about reaching out. The point is, why does, uh, why do we have a leadership deficit? There are about 10,000 books on leadership, 10,000 here. Yeah. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. There are 10,000 books on leadership. And there are a lot of organizations like Gary's organization, the Center of Creative Leadership, is teaching leadership for years. Harvard Business School has got about 15 different leadership programs. But yet, <coughs> yet we are talking about deficit of leadership. <coughs> Anyone would like to answer? Why do we don't have leaders <coughs> when we have leadership programs? So there's a lot of supply. And every company has got leadership development programs. <coughs> Every business school has got leadership programs. So we're talking about leadership, but yet there's a very serious drought of leadership. And I think, you know, after long thinking, I feel the point Jerry was also talking about, that we look at what we feel comfortable with. We all, all of us believe, I know who I am, I have the data that I need, I make the right choices, and life goes on. But the most of the time, we choose the data, we do not look at the truth, full data. And in the process, uh, we do not look at the real truth. So we end up believing, my belief is <coughs> truth, and that's how we keep on making mistakes, whether we are talking about the problem in, earlier in Sony, or the problem with the hacking, the problem with what happened in Pakistan, or what happened in, you know, every day there's a new news where right? there's a question of leadership at stake. So, 
I'll spend some time, given the background, about two minutes each, <coughs> just to paint the picture. What are the leadership challenges of the 21st century? Some of you have seen this presentation, but I often define the future of the world would be defined by these two vectors. The one would be the knowledge intensity would continue to increase. The other one, the complexity of the world is going to increase. So in this world, which is moving towards the top right hand corner, what would leadership mean, given that there are several factors which will drive both knowledge intensity as well as complexity? So the leadership framework of the 21st century would need these five things which I would like you to keep in mind. One is that we have to, on one side, have a very holistic perspective so that we can connect the dot. And at the same time, we have to be extremely local and be a customer. So when we are working on a problem in Nigeria, we have to really understand the problem in a place called Bonny Island, which is very different from northern <coughs> Nigeria, which is very different from Lagos. But yet you have to engage with the local with the global perspective. And often we fail right there. And the reason I brought up Bonny Island, by the way, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bonny Island, that's where most of the oil and gas companies are located. This is where you say Shell, Exxon, Chevrons totals of the world, the top multinationals. But the challenge that they face every day, on one side connect with Hague or London, where the headquarters of Shell is located, on the other side the local community, which is very, very different. So obviously you need personalities which can play the 007 role, <coughs> which is on one side be comfortable in 10 Downing Street, on the other side be comfortable in the bazaar in Istanbul, and be able to bring up the gun at the right time. But that is a very, very special personality. The second one we are talking about being very objective, third, real-time, insightful decision-making, and obviously continues to search for higher levels of being, and finally be able to inspire people all, all around. So I would not get into the details, but one thing I wanted to show you, because many of you are in the corporate world, how the scope of leadership is changing. If you go back, only 15 years ago, the part which is in the red triangle was good enough to be a good leader in a corporate sense. But today, given the complexity and the networking, the social media, the sudden changes that we live through, the leadership requirements of individuals have changed. So one of the biggest problems here we have on our times, the leaders who are leading companies today, they were shaped in the red zone area which is the right, top right hand side. But the leaders that they have to develop for the future would need to encompass the whole thing. So the models of leadership are not there. Whoever is a good model of leadership today would be inadequate in terms of more becoming a model of the future. And that's a very, very serious challenge. That what is the model of leadership in the 21st century? And that's why I think the programs that we do in Boston Place become very interesting to me because we are connecting with state-of-the-art issues and then asking ourselves, how do we come up with possible solutions? Just to give you an idea about the typical you know, organizational situation, we have been used to <coughs> terms like frontline, we use the word hierarchies. Uh, these are becoming all outdated. If you look at organization, we often think of boxes. As soon as you think of organization, we think of hierarchy. Who makes the decision? Who do I report to? Similarly, when you think of as leader, he says, I have the answer. I impose solutions. So a lot of the models, I'm not getting the details, of, are becoming outdated. That's why I've crossed them out. And a lot of the new requirements of sharing, involvement, catalyzing, building sense of ownership, helping people in the front line to get involved in a being stable versus unsettling. How do you unsettle yourself continuously, given the world is changing, are the new requirements of the 21st century. Very different. And that's where I think we feel challenged today, that as many books as we have on books on leadership, the lack of leaders. And I personally feel, one was what we discussed earlier, we have habits where we believe we know what we know, but we choose what to know what we know, but we do not know our staff. And the other is the organizational principles of leadership is also changing. Do you agree?
So that leads to the second point, which I will not get into. What is leadership? Now, I'll go through that very, very rapidly, but just to provoke some thoughts in your mind, because this is something I spent about five hours doing the next five slides, but I will do it in the next five seconds. But I think it's important, important for you to develop the idea. You know, when I ask people, what is leadership? These are the words that come out often. They are energizing, they're inspiring, they have charisma, they're winning. But as you could see, this is what you see in a leader. It doesn't tell you who you are. This is how you get connected with a leader. But then there are other words which comes up. Integrity, service, selfless, pathfinding, they're sensitive, they're self-confident. This is something deep inside. So often when we talk about leadership, unfortunately many of the books talks about the left-hand side, which is what people see. He's an inspiring leader. We talk about, let's say, uh, Steve Jobs. We, he's influencing. We talk about Warren Buffett. We make things happen. We talk about Lou Gershner. So there are, there indeed, we talk about people from certain aspects of the left-hand side. But what is really <coughs> want to practice is what you see on the right-hand side. And that often is not discussed. How do you ethically think? What is ethics? What is, how do you earn your honor? How do you earn people's trust? How do you display integrity? How do you display selflessness? Again, when Jahangir was talking about, sometimes we have seen 500 people in this room. It is a matter of selflessness. Maybe people were not feeling as selfless today as they felt 500 years ago, uh, five, uh, five years ago. So the point is, how to develop the right inside? the real challenge, and that's the side which goes back to what Jerry was talking about, the inner side of your personality, as opposed to the personality external to you, which is also important, but not enough. Now, often the other problem that we have when we talk about leadership, people talk about the left-hand side, but this is typically managers. You know, managers realize and control, they have eyes on the bottom line, but if you look at leaders, we are talking about something, a very different set of variables. Now, in a typical corporate world, people grow up as good managers, but as they become CEO, we are wanting him to be a leader, which is fundamentally different. But you have been shaped to be a good manager, but you are expected to be a good leader. And as you could see, I would like not again go into the details, there are very different requirements of yourself. Like inspiring trust is not about relying on control. Control becomes less important. Uh, you know, you can focus on bottom line versus focusing on the future. So obviously, the challenges are very different, and that's why there's a little bit of paradox because you want the left hand side to be a good manager, but yet you want to develop, develop the right side, which is fundamentally very different from what you need to be on the left hand side. And that's why I think often leadership deficit becomes visible because people typically feel comfortable with the left side and forget the right side. But both are important. So finally, a few thoughts on the future of the 21st century leadership. And I will just share with you a model for the next three minutes till we move to the drought of water, which is more physical. Leadership is more spiritual. But I think... Uh, it's important first to keep in mind that all of you have leadership traits. You know, leader, you know, there's a question often raised, are leaders born or leaders made? I personally feel leaders are uncovered, either by your own effort or by someone else, and sometimes remain totally covered, 99% of the cases. So everyone has the leadership traits of leadership. And the way they get manifested in Mother Teresa is obviously different the way it gets manifest in the person like you question. They're different, but both of them are great leaders. Perhaps Mother Teresa is a greater leader because without any money, without any resources, she built up an organization in uh, 160 countries with 360,000 nuns to serve the people of the base of the pyramid. That's a tremendous power, tremendous power. The traits manifest in different ways. That's the point I made. It is a continuous process of alignment. Effective leaders are great servants. 
is not about bossing, it's about being, serving a cause. And great leaders see greatness in others. So these are the five fundamental principles if you can celebrate, you would automatically see a different persona which would start defining you and who you are. And that is what I call the leadership dynamo. And there are two sides. One is the source of inspiration. Where does it come from? Like for us in the Boston place, the source of inspiration are the issues that people are struggling at the base of the pyramid. That's our external. But deep inside, for each one of us in this room, is who, are, who am I, know thyself, and how do I connect that, that me with the problem outside? And when we keep this cycle moving, natural leadership becomes very evident in your personality. But you have to fundamentally, passionately believe in some problem that we want to connect with, whatever that may be. Need not be the base of the pyramid, that's fine. But something that we want to connect with. And then ask, how do I maintain my stamina, my passion, whether one person shows up in this room or 5,000 people show up in this room? That really doesn't matter, as Jami was talking about. I think Jami summarized what leadership was all about very well in his first two minutes that you spoke about. Now, in the process, what you do is to open up the space. So if we did not care about water, if we do not care about the weather, if we do not care about the global warming, obviously we will be in the left-hand bottom corner. We are transactional, we are, want to be in the Saturday afternoon watching television or doing shopping before Christmas, before holidays. Or we could say that, look, let's look at some of the bigger issues of our times, build relationships based on our spiritual connection, intellectual connection with people around us. Now, the point I wanted to make finally is that when we talk about leadership, I think there are three powers that you want to unfold in yourself. The first power is the power of interconnecting. That how do I connect my inner self with people outside? And that is nothing to do with words. In fact, when I first had the privilege to watch Mother Teresa, she's a very, very quiet, small personality. But when she walks in the room, she connects with everyone. And I think that is because of the genuineness that she brings to play. It's not a lot of words, a lot of not colorful words at all. Uh, but just being who she is, I think she could connect. So that is something to think of how to cultivate. The second I would say, which all of you have, is the power of intellect, which is perhaps the easiest one, which is how do you solve problems? How do I structure problems? How do I uh, analyze problems and in the process display thought leadership. And the third one is the power of intuition, which comes from deep inside. That being able to see those dots which others don't see, be able to see those patterns which others don't see. In other words, being building on your intuitive capability. You know, we have been all listen, listening music, we had Walkman, but being able to look at music differently, that's why Steve Jobs came up with that. There's nothing brilliant until it happened. It's simple thinking. So I think that power of able to see things which normally are not defined by logic, but creates new reasoning, which I call the power of intuition. When these three powers come together, intuitive intellect and interconnectivity, your power to influence increases. Because leadership is all about how do we influence outcomes with or without titles, with or without resources, without excuses. That is what leadership is all about. If it is to be, it is up to me. And there's never an excuse that, well, he and she did not do this thing, or 500 people did not show up. That could not stop me or any of the members of the Boston Pledge not to take forward the Boston Pledge mission, or for you guys not to take the mission of water forward. So with this, I'd like to thank you very much. I took you through the, some of the thoughts on leadership, building on what uh, my expert friend had to share, Jerry, to really set the tone of another problem, which is the drought of water, which is more physical, easy to understand. Leadership, as Anil said, is very abstract, but very important. Because without leaders, we cannot solve the water problem. Without leaders, we will not be able to solve the problems in the basic and leaders is again not being bosses, 
but being individuals who can influence outcomes with or without titles, with a lot of resources or limited resources, as in Mother Teresa. <coughs> so with that, I'd like to thank you very much. Jerry, thank you very much. And I'd like to invite uh, my very, very dear friend, Corey, who you